Uh, first thing to say is thank you for coming back. And the second thing to say is thank you again for your warmth, generosity and kindness to a humble Brit like me. It's been wonderful. I love being in Houston. I was just saying to some friends down here that um, I love the southern states of America. And um, I, I, I kind of describe it like this. It suits my genetic conservatism to be here amongst you. <laughs> so last week I was talking to you from Romans 12 verse 2, which is um, be, uh, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind so that you may be able to determine the good and pleasing uh, will of God. And you would think that, you know, uh, ascertaining the will of God was a simple process. Um, I think it is, for most of us, a bit more complicated. And I don't know about you, but I found that the thing I need to eradicate in making decisions about what God wants for me, uh, sometimes there's a little too much of me in that decision-making. You know, I, I, I have wondered whether or not, especially when taking a kind of turn in life. Um, I was uh, very newly converted and a week away from joining the Grenadier Guards, which, um, sorry, the Coldstream Guards, which if you've seen um, our guards, you know, they wear these big bearskin hats and uh, they march amazingly well and that was going to be my life and I don't, you know, I don't hear voices. Well, I do, but they're medicated. But, um, just kidding. Uh, so, um, I, you know, I don't normally hear God speak so directly. And everything in me wanted to be an army officer. I had wanted to do that since year dot. I was all set to go to Sandhurst and the military academy and train and blah, blah, blah. God said to me, as clearly, as clearly as he, don't do this. It broke my heart. I mean, you've kind of built yourself up to a life and imagine what it might be like. I mean, whether it would have been like I imagined it, I don't know. But here's my point. We, we really, you know, a healthy instinct, if you're a disciple, a really healthy instinct is to have a deep desire to do God's will. A deep desire to do God's will. It should basically dominate your everyday life. And, and just to say that I think knowing God's will has kind of two aspects to it. One is what I would call God's general will for us. That is the teaching of Scripture, which is not like, you know, when, when the Bible says, um, don't get involved in filthy or obscene talk. That's not just for a few kind of people. That's for all of us, right? Don't commit adultery. You know, I was teasing with Marty this morning. He, he was ap apologizing quite needlessly at 8 o'clock. He felt he kind of fumbled reading the Decalogue, Ten Commandments. I said, oh, you've got to be careful with that. If you miss a knot out, you're in big trouble. <laughs> and, and, uh, but, the, the, you know, when, when God says, thou shalt not commit adultery, the bottom line is it doesn't mean that some of you can and some of you shouldn't. It's for all of us. So there's this general sense of God's will, which we discern largely through exposure to God's word. Then there's the issue of God's plan for my life and the decisions that I need to make in terms of how my life will go with God. Big decisions, some of them. You know, who, who am I going to marry? Big decisions like what kind of career do I plot for myself? And I think it's, it's kind of, um, it's really, it's more tricky than, than it sounds. And so the first thing that I, I want to say to you is that I think for this journey, you've got to be intentional. I would hope that after my stunning two lessons, you would leave this place highly intentional. 
that what you want to do is to make God's will for your life a total priority. And that comes with a health warning, right? Because God might ask you to do something that you really don't like. Okay? Um, there's a, a woman called Jackie Pullinger. Uh, you may have heard of her. She's an amazing uh, woman. I think she's in her early 60s now. When she was a teenager, she had a life laid out, largely by her parents, of course. And the, the life that was laid out for her was that she would go to college, as you would say, university in English. And she would um, go and study, and then she'd work out what kind of career she wanted. And she woke up one day, and God said to her, get on a boat. So she told her mum and dad about this. They're a Christian family, and the mother and father, well, you can't get on a boat, you know, you've got to go to college. So the parents came up with a cunning plan, which they thought would kind of completely wreck their daughters. And they sent her to see the local vicar. There's a man called Colin Ford. I knew him well. He's a funny old stick. And uh, so she went in and she said, God's told me to get on a boat. Colin Ford said, well, if God's told you, you better get on a boat. <laughs> and she was led to a boat, went to Hong Kong. And when they got to Hong Kong, God said to her, get off. She got off. And she has had the most unbelievable ministry. It used to be in the old wall city of Hong Kong, which is where there are, you know, scores of people who take enough heroin, they would kill a racehorse every day. And she's, I mean, the testimony is remarkable. People, you know, being healed by God of addiction. And within minutes, they're not even going through cold turkey. They're just healed of the addiction. She married one of these guys, and fortunately he pumped so much heroin into his system before he became a Christian that he died fairly. Look, you've got to be intentional and you've got to be open to what it is God might say to you. Talking to an evangelist in the UK and told me about his mum. <laughs> she was in a retirement home, you know. The age of 86, God told us she's going to become an evangelist. She left the retirement home, started to preach. People were coming to Christ. She died at 98. A lot of people became Christians. So listen, if you are, he said delicately, of more senior years, God ain't done with you yet. So you've got to be intentional about this. The second thing is, um, our journey through life, sorry, I clicked it twice, has a destination. Um, we are told in one or two places in the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 11 is one, where we are, as Christians, we are strangers and aliens in this world. This is not our final destination. I don't know whether you ever think about that. You know, do you, do you think of yourself as somebody who's passing through to go to somewhere that's better? And I don't know, we can't really imagine what heaven would be like. I mean, I slightly wear thin on the idea that um, it's going to be like um, worship all day long. You know, I, I mean, I like worship, but I'm not sure I could tolerate it all day long. Uh, I need a break occasionally, you know what I'm saying? Um, but we, we are uh, on a destination, and uh, in Hebrews, this amazing uh, chapter 11, which is all about faith and God's kind, you know, kind of uh, gallery of Jewish all-stars, you know, people who by faith, by faith, by faith uh, did stuff. And in chapter 13, the writer of the epistle says, all these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And when they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth, sorry, and they admitted that they were strangers and aliens on earth. In verse 16, uh, instead, 
these people who live by faith, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. I mean, do you all think about that? You know, this is not your final destination. Death, if you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, is not a brick wall. It's a gateway. It's a gateway to something better. And I kind of figure that 21st century Christians actually don't think about that enough. You know, that we are people passing through. This is transitory uh, for us. We're, we're in the transit lounge. Can I put it like that? And believers are going to heaven now. I just want to say this to you because I think within the Church of England and I suspect within the Episcopal Church, the idea of being assured of a place in heaven sounds to some of you like arrogance. And it would do if it was anything to do with you. But it is by grace you've been saved. It's God's initiative, God's plan. And what you've done is accepted what Christ did for you on the cross of Calvary. As I said in church this morning, thank God. Thank God it's an empty cross because he's alive. In the power of his spirit, he's in this house right now with us. Wanting to whisper in your ear, and call you to a new level, a new depth of commitment with the destination of your journey in the forefront of your mind. Third one, and I mean, I hate saying this to you. Um, always carry forgiveness in your travel rucksack. Forgive us our tres you say trespasses, right? We say trespass. We speak English. <laughs> forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Oh my goodness. I've told this story before, but I think it's worthy of repeat. I mean, it's just one of the most amazing things that happened in my ministry, and, and believe me, there are a number of amazing things that have happened. But I was teaching in the Cathedral of the Advents in Alabama. And I preached, uh, like I did this morning, on John chapter 3, verse 16. And I made it, it I made it very Billy Graham. And... Um, the dean, I go into the vestry at the end of the, the robing room at the end of it, and the dean says to me, uh, I don't think you should preach like that in this cathedral. I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, blow my welcome in. I may, and he goes, no, 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 I'm starting to apologize. He goes, no, no, no. He said, I want to say to you, if you feel a nudge of the Holy Spirit to get people to respond to what you're saying, then I'd like you to do that. Never been done in that cathedral, ever. And it was too late for the Billy Graham sermon. So I'm doing Lent lectures all week, and on the Wednesday I'm talking about forgiveness. And as I came to the end of my talk, I felt a nudge of the Spirit to give people an opportunity that if they had a forgiveness issue in their lives, to come forward and be prayed for. So I made the invitation, you know, if you, if you have an issue that really troubles you about unforgiveness in your life, come forward and we'll pray for you. And then, you know, the organist is kind of twiddling away while people are going. Or So I go to the front of the church. I got my back to the congregation. A devil saying to me, you idiot. <laughs> you will turn around and there'll be no one there. You can go get lunch. I turned around. The dean said there were 600 people crammed into the sanctuary. And it was only earlier last year that I got a letter. This is 20 years ago now. I got a letter from somebody who said, I haven't spoken to my mother for 40 years. And your sermon won't leave me alone. I rang her up. And it's going to be okay. See, you have no idea when what your ability to forgive can release into this world. No idea. But 
I get it. Some of you have been hurt. Hurt beyond that which you wonder whether you will ever recover from. Hurt that stems from being a person who has been lifelong abused or controlled. These are huge things. And I wouldn't even tell you to attempt this if I hadn't heard that woman, Jean Lakin, uh, at the Episcopal Church Women's Lunch. They ignored my gender for a while and let me go there. I mean, this is a woman. She didn't tell her whole story because it is horrific, but she saw her own father hacked to death in Rwanda. Uh, she had some foster parents who brought her to America. It turned out the guy was an abuser and sexually abused her over a season. All her family gone murdered by another tribe. And you're like, how does anybody, how does anybody ever get past that? I mean, would you think that would be a fair question? How would anybody ever get past that? And yet there is this vibrant young woman standing in front of us despite everything that she has gone through. And she's telling us that forgiveness is the only way out of it. I mean... I, you know, I'm just like, my heart skips a beat even telling you about that. We are called as people who are forgiven to be people who forgive. And I recognize, you know, that for some of you, the people that you hold something again have died. You're like, so what am I supposed to do? Look, it's all about getting your heart right with God. Even if you can't go to that person and apologize, at least in your heart, you can talk with God and seek the power of His Holy Spirit to forgive the people who've hurt you. This is such an important thing. And if you're going to journey through life as a disciple, you're going to, you're going to take note of this. Hebrews 11 verse 6 moving on, takes us to, um, there we go, F you're going to have faith. We sing hymns about it. We tell um, stories about it. We say amen to prayers about faith. When push comes to shove, how much faith do we deploy? We, you know, ask yourself this question. Where does my security actually lie? Is it in things? You know, it seems like an attractive option, doesn't it? That, that, you know, we need some money, we need a little life insurance, we need, you know, things. But if that's where our security is, we need to just think again. In Luke's gospel, there was a, a rich man, uh, you might remember him, uh, and he came up with a, a great, be, uh, um, a wonderful business plan that he was a successful grain farmer. And his plan was, I'm going to build some big barns so that I can store grain that doesn't get sold this year, that if next year is a difficult year, then I got some grain I can still sell. Anybody in the house who knows anything about business would say, great plan, great business expansion plan. As far as we know, this story never tells us that this guy's immoral, cheating on his wife or stealing or anything like that. And he comes to this conclusion, having made his money, let us eat, drink and be merry. Remember Shakespeare quoted that, but he added, for tomorrow we die. And on the night that he died, God said to him, you, you fool. I didn't even know God used that kind of language. You fool. Because what he trusted in, 
I can imagine that, that if he'd lived in Houston in 2023, he'd have been a respectable guy. Probably showed up at St. Martin's. Uh, you know, wearing a sharp suit and talking fancy. Yet, this guy had missed the whole point. I am... Um, I, I taught my children, which did cause some marital disharmony. I taught my kids two things broadly. I taught them a lot of things, but two big things. Are, one, take risks. And the reason I did that, I thought that children in Christian homes need to be taught to take risks because very, it's when you face taking a risk that you decide whether you're going to trust God or whether you're going to do it yourself. And, I mean, all that went quite well until <laughs> my wife came home one day and I was trying to persuade my son Nick to jump out the first story window. <laughs> she was not amused. And uh, anyway, did it and um, survived. Do we put ourselves in places where we need to trust God? And if you're going to do that, there is one thing that you're probably going to have to face, and that is fear. In the Bible, the phrase, do not be afraid, occurs more than any other phrase. I encountered it, but I, think, I actually think, this is kind of notable in a way if you're weird about numbers, I think it occurs 365 times, once a day. Leap year is a little tricky, but 365 times, don't be afraid. There are people in the house this morning, their lives are dominated by a fear. It could be anything. I remember um, Louis Smedes wrote this. He said, um, some of us are scared of spiders. Some of us are scared of heights. And some of us are scared of lobsters. It's like, pity the poor person who has a fall and lands on a lobster. <laughs> and, you know, there are those things that, that we can live with easily, you know. I mean, I don't mind spiders, but I live in a house full of women who do, apparently. Those little things, but it's the big, gripping things. You know, those of you who've been hurt in relationships, the pain of rejection, which brings with it the fear of commitment. You know, God wants to help you get past that. So faith... It's going to be an important part of your journey through life. And um, as a decide, you know, I mean, it's kind of, yeah, I mean, Jesus said some scary stuff like, you know, are you going to do even greater things than I did? Well, I'm going to speak about my life. I mean, I'm still waiting. I, I still am. But I believe what Jesus said, you know, it's just maybe, a, and Jesus did, just on occasions, then he had a little uh, nibble at his disciples saying, you know, where's your faith? Didn't have enough faith. And when he came up against really difficult things, he said, you know, these things require faith and fasting. Faith is what accesses the grace of God when we are, become Christians. And faith is something you need to take with you through your journey in life. And my last point is this. Limit your inputs in life to sanctify your outputs. Let me explain what I mean by that. It's so basically... Your brain is an unbelievably sophisticated organ. I mean, even now, 
as you sit staring at me, blinking. There are so many interactions going on between the nerves in your eye and your brain. We are, as the psalmist said, fearfully and wonderfully made. You know, I'm getting to the point now where looking in a mirror is a slightly painful thing for me. I tell myself, you're fearfully and wonderfully made. It's just that some bits have fallen off these days. <laughs> but the thing about the brain is, and we're, you know, most of what we've learned about the human brain, we've, we've learned in the last 25 years, is relatively new. What you might call developed thinking in the world of neuroscience. We're learning all kinds of things about how behaviors can start to rewire our brain, if that's not too simplistic an explanation. So if you think that doing stuff like watching pornography or messing about on your cell phone too much doesn't harm you, it does. You know this, that there is not one big hitter in Silicon Valley, you know, tech center of planet Earth. Not one leader of any of those companies who would allow their kid to go to a school that allowed cell phones in. Do you know why? Because they're designed to be addictive. Turn on things in your brain, they rewire it. Is all lost? Well, no, because if you come under conviction that what you're doing is wrong, watching pornography or messing about on a cell phone or being obsessed with shopping or, you know, your brain will respond to behaviors that cut against the behaviors that you initially were convicted about. It is possible to rewire your brain. Let me say, it's a bit easier when you're younger. But it is possible. So I think there are, you know, two things that this generation of Christians, us, have had to face that no other generations of Christians have ever had to face. One is mass marketing, meant to unsettle you, meant to make you want more, I'm not saying all oh, marketing's bad. You know, if you're a marketing person, don't kill me. Some of it's informative and good and, you know, gives you the basic information you might need to make an acquisition on. But, the, you know, this thing of wanting more. St. Paul said in Philippians chapter 4, I've learned to be content in any and every situation, whether in need or whether in times of plenty. Have you ever wondered, those of you who, you know, have had a comfortable life, I put it like that, have you ever wondered how you would cope if your life became really uncomfortable? I've got friends who came out of poverty and, and did well, but they're terrified of going back into poverty. It affects the way they behave, it affects the way they think. So what I'm suggesting gently to you here is that you might limit those inputs to your brain that might end up leading you to destructive behaviors. Limit your input to sanctify your output. God wants us to live the life that he has for us. God wants you to live the life that he has for you. And friends, in this journey called life, tough journey for many of us. I would just ask you, plead with you, beseech you to use an old word. Think about this stuff. Because, let me end where I started, we don't want to be conformed to this world. We want to be transformed by the renewal of our minds. What you put into your mind will affect what comes out in your behaviors. We need to be wise about this and think about it a little more. I'm not suggesting, you know, that you should throw your cell phone down the lavatory or something. And no, I, you know, I don't think it's a, 
This is not, I mean, it's not a call to extremist behavior. But it's a call just to think more about this. And this is Lent. This is the kind of stuff we're supposed to be thinking about in this season of self-reflection and repentance. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. I wonder, this Lent, if we need to give a little more thought to this. Don't shout it out, but you might like to just try this in your mind. Give yourself a mark out of 10. In terms of how do I feel the transformation that God wants for me is going? One out of 10 is back to the drawing board. 10 out of 10 is a lie. Hmm? Where would you put yourself? I mean, don't shout out. Just go away and think about it this Lent. Think about if I came out of Lent, maybe scoring even a half mark or one more mark, that would be a good Lent for you and for me. There's stuff I need to think about myself. I know that. I know that. Let, let me tell you what a complicated person I am. So I know that it's wrong to judge people. You all know that too, don't you? I still do it. I can still superficially make an assessment of someone in such a way that makes me, you know, just awkward in the relationship. I, I don't particularly gossip a lot, but when I get together with kind of clergy colleagues, we like a little bit of ecclesiastical tittle-tattle. <laughs> Who's gone here? Who's gone there? You know, why am to Harry? Yeah. Right? I need help with that. But the worst thing is, and I hope you'll pray for me, is that whatever patience looks like, the Holy Spirit's still got a job to do on me. I can be very impatient. I've even said words in a traffic jam that are not worthy of a bishop. <laughs> but the worst output of my patience is with my dear wife, who not only survived a horrific car accident, but has had cancer twice. Nearly died of pneumonia just before Christmas. And I can be impatient with her. The woman I respect and love most on planet Earth. The woman who's borne my five children and is bankrupting me by buying presents for our grandchildren. <laughs> Fifteen of them. I can be scratchy with her. Especially that, you know, one of the things that seems to have come out of the, um, look, you, you don't even know more about me. I mean, you might shoot yourself, but here's the point. We are all in need of this kind of healing. We are all in need of trying to limit our behaviors that we know are not godly, but have become so accustomed to our behaviors that we, we've even given up on trying to do something about it. Can I encourage you? Think about that stuff in your life this late. And let's together see what happens. Dear friends, thank you for listening. I'm going to pray with you now. And then we have... What's that say? That looks like 5.14 on that clock to me. Right? 10.52. Pardon? 10.52. Okay. I just got these specs as well. <laughs> so, um, let's pray, shall we? Our gracious Father, um, 
There are many things in our lives that, as disciples, we've got sorted and don't particularly trouble us anymore. But Father, this Lent, I want us to sweat through the big stuff. How faithful are we? How forgiving are we? How intentional are we to live the life that God in Christ has for us? And Father, we thank you so much that when we start to think about what Jung would have called the shadow side of our existence, Lord, that you've not left us on our own to deal with that. But you sent your Holy Spirit. Lord, your Holy Spirit can work in a number of ways through counselors, through therapists, whatever. But Lord, we know that we will, yeah, we know that we will heal best when we're prepared to admit to you the gravity of the wounds we bear. So we ask, come, Holy Spirit in your grace and in your power. And this Lent, help us to be healed. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So, any questions? No? Um, yes. Sometimes I think it's very hard to discern when it's the Holy Spirit versus, you know, you know, hey. Do you have a way of... Do you want to repeat? Do you want to repeat? I think that's on. Sometimes it's hard to discern when it's the Holy Spirit versus, I don't like to say his name, do you know who? It's versus, sorry, can you just say it again? Right. You all heard that? Yeah. Well, of course, you're quite right in that the devil will tempt you, and what the devil wants to do is to destroy you. Um, as um, Jesus said, you know, um, allegorizing about the devil, the thief comes to steal and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it in all its fullness. See, you need to, the first thing is that um, God will never ask you to do something against his word. Second, God will never suggest anything to, uh, you know, want you to do something that might lead to your destruction. I told a story in church last week of this poor guy, Ronnie, you know, hooked on fentanyl in uh, you know, living on the street in uh, Vancouver. And the t his terrible commentary on his life, you know, and he isolates one moment, one moment, when he could have decided to take drugs or not take drugs. And he said that was the start of it. His conclusion was, I hate my life, and I hope every morning I won't wake up. I, I really... You know, I mean, he's got terrible complexion and cuts on him and sores and he looked in a terrible state. I doubt he's 30 years old. And what you can reckon is that that is one up for the devil. So you have to be discerning about that. You know, what, um, would God ask me to do anything against his word? Would he, um, you know, ask me to do something... It, a lot of human beings are the result of actions they took which delivered unintended consequences. Like that extra drink. Oh, you know, smoke a joint. It's not a big deal. Well, for some people it really is, and it destroys them. So we've got to be wise as serpents about this stuff. I'm sorry, I, you know, I wish I had a simpler answer for you, but yeah. Anything else? Okay, I'm going to say class dismiss. <laughs>